So good morning. Uh, today we're starting a new teaching called Why Do I Need Jesus? So we're starting on session one of Why Do We Need Jesus? So today what I'd like to do is we're gonna, well not today, but in the in this next two sessions, what I'd like to do is answer four questions, okay? Um, number one will be this, what was God's original intent? Why do I need Jesus? And within Why Do We Need Jesus, uh, I have three subsections, the event, the effect, and the solution, okay? The third question is, who is salvation available to? And the last question, question number four, is how do I get saved, okay? So let's get rolling here. And uh, point number one, question number one, what was God's original intent? In Genesis chapter one, verses 27 to 28, Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 28, in the New King James Version, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue it and have dominion over the earth. The Briggs' definition for dominion is to rule, to have dominion, to dominate, or to tread down, to have dominion. In John chapter 10, verse 24, in the New Living Translation, John chapter 10, verse 24, in the New Living Translation, it says, The people surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work that I do in my Father's name. But you, but you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. In verse 31, once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. Man, tough crowd, huh? They don't like what you're, sta what you're saying. They start picking up stones to stone you. Man, I wouldn't want to be preaching to that crowd. In verse 32, it says, And Jesus said, At my Father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one, for which one are you going to stone me? They replied, We're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You are a mere man. Claim to be God? Now, if you never read this scripture before, or maybe you read it, but you didn't really, uh, we weren't really paying attention to it, um, all of your guards are going to come up when I say this, right? So, all your guards are going to come up, right? And you're going to be like, oh, what's up with that? So I just want to just put you at ease before I read the next scripture. Um, it, I'm going to be reading the scripture, okay, I'm going to let the word speak for itself, and this is Jesus speaking, so it's important that we uh, look at it from that perspective, okay? So just be at ease, let the word speak for itself. In verse 34, it says, Jesus replied, it is written in your own scriptures that God says certain leaders of the people, I say to you, I say, you are gods. I say, you are gods. And you know that the scripture cannot be altered. So if those people who receive God's message were called gods, why do you call it blasphemy when I say I am the son of God? After all, the father set me apart and sent me into the world. Don't believe me unless I carry out my father's work. But if I do his work, I believe in the evidence of the miraculous work I've, I've done. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous work I have done. Even if, I, even if you don't believe me, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me, and if I, I am in it, I, and, <laughs> and I am in the Father. Once again, they tried to arrest him, but he got away and left them. Psalms chapter 82, verse 5, and again, this is in the New Living Translation. But, those, but these oppressors know nothing. They are so ignorant, they wander about in darkness while the whole world is shaken to the core. I say, you are gods. You are, you are all children of the Most High. But you will die like mere mortals and fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God. 
big G, now this is talking about God, rise up, O God, and judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. When the word calls us God, it's referring to the power and authority that God has given to us um, as mankind, the, the authority that God gave Adam originally, okay? So what was God's original intent? God's original intent for, uh, for, was for us to rule and reign on the earth like God, with God's authority and power that was invested into Adam. That was God's original intent, okay? So in, uh, question number two was, why do I need Jesus? And again, I had three uh, subsections in here. Today, we're going to cover the event and the effect. And then on our next, uh, next week, we'll cover the solution, okay? So the event, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the, from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. So let me just stop right there uh, before we move on. Why have a conversation with the devil? John 10.10 10 says, The thief's purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. The thief, the devil's only purpose, this is his sole purpose in this world, is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But my purpose, God's purpose, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So why even engage with the devil? That makes absolutely no sense, right? Never engage with the devil on his terms. If you engage with the devil in his terms, he is going to chew you up and spit you out. Okay? You're in his game. That's going into the lion's den when you do that. You don't want to engage with the devil and have a conversation with him. Hello? Our response should be, shut up, be gone in the name of Jesus. That's how you respond to the devil, okay? You don't start engaging and having a dialogue and spending time and listening. Everything that he's doing is strategically, strategically working to kill, steal, and destroy, right? You don't want to be engaging and having a conversation with the devil. In James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Therefore, submit to God resist the devil and he will flee from you resist the devil shut up okay that's all you need to tell him be gone in the name of jesus that's what you do when the devil is speaking to you whether it's speaking to you in your mind or is engaging with you through someone else whether it's intentionally or unintentionally um, be careful who you're letting speak into your life that's not going to turn out good if you engage in a conversation with the devil now i know i can just hear this reverberating uh through time as people watch the videos and people are, are saying already but jesus responded <laughs> with to the devil by quoting scriptures so let me ask you this one question uh for one thing are you the word became flesh that dwelt among us jesus was the word that became flesh that dwelt among us jesus was the word jesus had complete understanding and knowledge of the word and revelation of the word and let me ask you this do you have revelation of the kingdom of god perfect revelation of the kingdom of god we're not jesus jesus could engage toe to toe, -to -toe with the devil all day long for eternity and stomp him every time for most people out there for most of us out there we're not going to be able to go toe to toe with the devil and rise up victorious so be careful Okay? You don't want to be engaging with the devil like that. Okay, Verse 3, it says, it on, It's only the fruit from the tree, the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat or even touch it. If you do, you will, you will die. Just a quick note here. God didn't say if you touch it. He said if you eat from it, you will die. This was Eve responding. God told Adam, that if you eat it, you will die. And she didn't have understanding of this because this didn't come directly. This was second inform secondhand information given to Eve from Adam, right? In verse 4, you won't die, the devil said, right? You won't die. The serpent replied to the woman. And let me just point this out here, okay? Remember this. An effective lie, 
is always sprinkled with a little bit of truth. An effective lie will be always sprinkled with a little bit of truth, right? If it's an outright, straight up lie, right? Automatically, guards come up. Guards come up, right? You're ready. You're ready because it's there's it's an outright lie. But if you sprinkle it with a little bit of truth, now it's effective. Now, now you just taste it a little bit. Oh, it doesn't taste that bad, right? Now you just take it all in. Take it all in because it's sprinkled with a little bit of truth. Be careful, be careful of that. Um, whenever the devil is working, whenever uh, someone is trying to accomplish something that is not good, they will always sprinkle it with a little bit of lie. I mean, a little bit of truth. In verse 5, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. You will be like God. There we go with the three G's again, right? What is the three G's? Guys or girls, gold and glory, right? You will be like God. Oh, I want the glory. I want to be like God. Verse 5, God knows that your eyes will be open. So, Okay, that's the one I just covered, sorry. In verse 6, the woman was convinced. See, she engaged with the devil. She had a conversation with the devil, and now she's convinced. Now she's convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sold fig leaves together and covered themselves. So check this out. The first thing that changed was they felt shame. As soon as they ate the fruit, the first thing they felt was shame. Shame was not part, was not a part of God's original intent. Shame was not a part of God's original intent. In verse 8, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you were walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Point number two, the second thing they felt was fear. The second thing that they felt was fear. Fear, for us to be in fear, was not a part of God's original intent. Fear was not a part of God's original intent. In verse 11, who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman. <laughs> it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the blaming game started, right? It's everyone else's fault but mine, right? It started back in the garden with Adam. We blame everyone else ourselves we don't take responsibility for our own actions in verse 13 it says then the Lord God asked the woman what have you done the serpent deceived me she replied that's why I ate it she's following after the man doing exactly what the man did he's the leader and he just taught her how to pass blame then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. I wonder what the serpent looked like prior to the fall, prior to this happening. It's pretty interesting. At work, they have some statues of different things, and they have a statue of a serpent, a snake, and it actually has feet and legs, uh, feet, I mean legs and um, hands. So it's pretty interesting. I wonder what the serpent looked like prior to the Jesus, uh, to God cursing them. And I, will cause and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offsprings and her offsprings. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. So I want to point this out here, okay? This is, as far as it's saying that you will control your husband, I'm not, sh I, I don't really think that that's what the original uh, scripture intent was. In the New King James Version it says, you will desire, you, your desire shall be for your husband and he will rule over you. It doesn't say that you will control your husband. It says that your desires shall be for your husband. You see this a lot in other countries. 
where the man rules over the woman, right? The woman is wanting to have relationship with man or the husband, but they're actually property and they're treated like property in other countries. That is what this is. That's what I believe this is talking about. This is not, this is the, the um, New Living Translations translates it as you would desire to control your husband. I think that's a better perspective to look at it. Like in other foreign countries where a woman is treated more like property, right? She desires to have a relationship with her husband, but he's just ruling over, he's treating her. Um, sometimes they're treated worse than a dog. That's not good, right? Not good. Thank God that we've, um, we've been, we in the United States are a lot, we've progressed from there where we treat women good. We treat them with respect. Amen. And a bridge definition for desire is desire, longing, or craving. That's why I kind of look at it that way. That the, um, the desire, desire, and the definition for that is to desire to have longing for or craving for their spouse or their husband. And it says here also in that verse, it says um, that I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. So that wasn't a part of God's original intent. Um, pain during childbirth was not a part of God's original intent. So keep this in mind that as a, as a born again Christian, as a New Testament Christian, pain in childbirth, uh, we can have a painless childbirth. In fact, my wife and I, uh, we were, Heidi and I, we were believing for that when we had uh, Kayla, that she would have a painless childbirth. Um, Heidi ended up having a C-section. We ended up having complications. And she experienced some pain while we were uh, having Caleb. So let me ask you this one question. Does that change the truth of what the word says? Because my experience was that we didn't experience a, our experience was that we didn't experience a, a, a painless childbirth. Does that change the truth of the word? No. We missed it somewhere, okay? We need to be humble enough to admit that, that, I, that we missed it. We missed it somewhere. The word is the final authority, right? That is part of the curse. We are redeemed from the curse. So we, if we believe and we put our faith out there, and if we're not missing it somewhere, we should be able to have a painless childbirth. Amen? All the women is like, what? I got to meditate on that for a little while, right? <laughs> okay. In verse 17, it says, And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you eat of its grain. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat. Uh, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. And the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing for the animal from animal skins for Adam and his wife. So that was the first sacrifice for sin, right? God needed to kill an animal and use their skin uh, to make clothing for Adam and Eve. In verse 22, it says, Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings are becoming like us knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take the fruit from the tree of life and eat it? They will live forever. Look, this is the issue right here. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? They will live forever. Can you see God's grace in this? See, that's why I, I, I made a statement that if you don't have revelation of grace, I highly recommend that you don't read the Old Testament until you get revelation of grace and that's because of that exact reason right there if we read the old testament and, and we and we read it and god is all of a sudden kicking man out of the garden man that's wow god man man is falling now you're just going to kick him out of the garden and and they're going to have to just scratch a living and women's going to have hard childbirths and all these kinds of things right but if you look at it and you understand grace you will see god's grace in the word so think about this now, what is God's concern? God doesn't want man to live forever in this state. Why? Because now we're in a fallen state. Now, can you imagine what it would be like if we never died? If we lived on this earth for eternity? I mean, the earth is only a few thousand years old. Uh, since Jesus came, it's only been a couple thousand years or so, right? Can you imagine what 
the earth would turn into and what it would be like a hundred thousand years from now or a million years from now with the world totally corrupted. That was the grace of God, the love of God that put man out of the garden. Amen? In verse 23, it says, So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the garden of Eden. He placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth, uh, black, back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And can I just say this? Man, go easy on Adam and Eve. Let me ask you all this question. How many of you ever sinned? Right? How many of you ever sinned? Many times, right? Maybe even today you did something that you shouldn't have done, right? So let me, let, me, let me just point this out right here, okay? If Adam and Eve didn't eat the fruit, one of us would have by now. One of us would have eaten the fruit by now, okay? So go easy on Adam and Eve. So what was the event? Adam sinned, right? The event was Adam sinned, and because Adam sinned, that changed the entire, uh, uh, that changed everything. Now man is no longer in its uh, in, in his place where we're supposed to be to rule and reign on the earth, right? That was the effect. Okay, so now we're going. Sorry, now we're going to to the effect. Okay, so what is the effect of what Adam did? Adam sinned. So we are now in a fallen state. The entire earth and everything in its atmosphere are affected by what just happened. We are now in a fallen state. The entire earth and everything in its atmosphere are affected by what just happened. Right now, we have a hurricane. Um, we just passed the big island, and it's heading to the other islands, Oahu and possibly Kauai, right? That effect is because of that fallen state, is because of the sin that Adam committed. That, is not, that was not part of God's original intent. But because the earth is travailing right now, right? The word talks about that. The earth is travailing. We're seeing all of these natural disasters and things like that happening right now. Satan is now the god of this world. He now has the power and authority to rule and reign on the earth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, Satan, who is god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. How did that transfer take place, right? So what, what is that transfer? How did that happen? How did Satan end up with that power and authority that was delegated to man, to Adam? Obviously, there's a law in the kingdom of God, right? There's a law in the kingdom of God that must state that if man transgress, then man will forfeit that authority, right? So now Satan has that authority and he's wrecking havoc on mankind and the entire earth and its atmosphere, okay? In Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, in the New Living Translation, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 20, 21, it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. That is why Jesus needed to be born of a virgin birth. If he were conceived naturally, he would have had been born with sin. So because Jesus was born without sin and lived a sinless life, he could be offered as a perfect sacrifice. Okay, let me read, let me read that again, okay? That is why Jesus needed to be born of a virgin birth. If he were conceived naturally, he would have been born with sin. Okay, that sin is transferred through man now because of Adam. What, Adam, what happened with Adam? When Adam sinned, whenever someone else is conceived through Adam, that person has sin all, already in them. That's an interesting point to think about here, right? Some people believe that um, every, everyone didn't come through Adam because of some scriptures. They say that there were other people on the earth that God created besides Adam. That is not true. Everyone has sinned. Why? Because they all came through Adam. Okay? Let's make sure the word speaks for itself. That is why Jesus needed to be born of a virgin birth. If he were conceived naturally, he would have been born with sin. So because Jesus was born without sin and lived a sinless life, he could be offered as a perfect sacrifice. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be, to be the offering for our sins, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be an offering for our sins, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. In verse 13, it says, Yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Okay, now look at this. That was the reason the Mosaic law was put into place. The Mosaic law was put into place so that people would under people would have a standard of what is right or wrong, right? So think about it um, uh, in a in a natural way. Okay, look at this from a uh, from a uh, relative way. Uh, think about this. One person's standard, my standard of what is right and wrong, may be here. Another person's standard of what is right and wrong may be here. Another person's standard of what is right and wrong may be down here. So what is the real standard? In fact, we see that a lot of times that people that commit hideous crimes in their own minds, in their own minds, they think that what they did was right and good. Okay, in their, own mind, in their own minds, they convinced themselves that what they did was right and good. So that's why the law was given, so that man would have a gauge, a uh, standard, that this is right and this is wrong. That is the whole purpose of the law. The law was put into place to show us that we could not be perfect, we could not earn righteousness, or we could not be in right standing with God, because no one could live up to that standard. Amen. Romans chapter 7, verse 7, in the New King James Version, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. We would not know what was sin or what was not sin because there was no standard before the law. In verse 14, Romans chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Still everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God, as Adam did, now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ, who is yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought debt to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man's Jesus Christ, right? God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Grace came through Jesus Christ. Why am I not reading this right? And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of what one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to one being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Sorry, I normally read the New King James Version, and I'm starting to use the New Living Translation more. I think it's easier for people to understand. So when I'm reading it now, I'm reading it from a, and subconsciously, I'm looking at it from the New King James, so I'm tripping up on my words sometimes. So I apologize for that. In verse 17, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over man, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but, God, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone that is awesome it says it right there right let me read that again 18 yes adam's one sin bring condemnation for everyone but christ's one act of righteousness brings a right right relationship with god and new life for everyone amen in verse 19 because one person disobeyed god many became sinners but because one other person obeyed god many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful 
they were. That's what I was just talking about, right? God's law was given so that all, so that all people could see how sinful they were. The law was not put out there so that people could try to obtain righteousness through the law. No, that pointed out, man, I messed up. I need a savior. I need to be redeemed, right? When you look at the law and this is God's standard, this is what righteousness means. Now I know I cannot be righteous. The standard is set too high, right? So that is why we need a savior. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more and more abundant. As sin abounds, grace abounds, right? So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me read that section again. God's wonderful grace, hallelujah, thank you Jesus. God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So closing with this, let me close with this. What was God's original intent? It was for man to rule and reign on the earth like God. God's original intent was for man to rule and reign on the earth like God, using God's delegated power and authority that was given to Adam, right? Why do we need Jesus, right? We covered the, three, the two, sub, two of the three subtopics, right? Because of the event. What was the event? The event was Adam's sin. That sent us into a downward spiral, right? All of a sudden, now man is all messed up. Man forfeits that authority and that power. Satan, because of that law, somehow transgressed. And now Satan is the God of this world. Now Satan has all power and authority on the earth, okay? So what was the effect of that event? We're now in a fallen state. The entire earth and everything in its atmosphere are affected by what just happened, right? Everything in the earth is, we're in a fallen state. Everything has changed. Everything is affected now. We, you know, sometimes we attribute so many bad things to God. Why does bad things happen to good people? Why do we have all these natural disasters, right? All these th bad things that happen. And this is just a side note, but I think that this is important. Let me just say this. Oftentimes we say nothing happens outside of the will of God. Man, that is nothing farther from the truth. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is no truth at all. A lot of things happen outside of the will of God. Man, and I can hear people saying right now, that is blasphemy. What do you mean? Nothing happens outside of the will of God. I promise you a lot of things happen outside of the will of God. Let me ask you this one question. Is it God's will for every person to be saved? Is everybody invited to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Yes, right? Anyone that knows anything about Christianity knows that everyone's invited to the party, right? No one is kept out. No one is discriminated against. Everyone is invited to the party, right? Everyone is, has, the, has the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, right? But does everyone go to heaven? No, right? Why? If, if it was God's will for every person to go to heaven, then every single person would go to heaven, right? But that's not the case. That's the same thing as saying, Every bad thing that happens on the face of the earth is God's will. God either permitted it or God, um, God caused it or God either permitted it. Think about every bad thing that happens on the face of the earth. All the rape, the murder, the child abductions, all this craziness that is going on in the earth. If everything happens, has to happen, is God's will. Is either God causing it to happen or God allowing it to happen, then God is one sick being, right? If I, if I did all the things that is attributed to God, they have, they have institutes for people like that called prison. And they have chairs, hot seats for them to sit on, right? Right? The electric chair, right? Why? Why do we attribute all these bad things to God? That is a lie from the pit of hell. Everything that happens on the face of the earth is not, is not to do with the will of God. We are in a fallen state right now. 
Man has fallen. Adam sinned. Now, Satan, the god of the world, is causing, wrecking havoc on the earth and better at attributing that to God. I can't imagine when, when people say that every time people say that nothing happens outside of the will of God, someone loses a child. Well, you know what? God must have needed a, another angel in heaven, right? God must have. Man, that is sick. That is sick to say that. Man, that, that might bring comfort for the moment, but man, that'll cause resentment towards God in the long run. We gotta make sure that we're not taking the lies from the devil, these, these um, old wives' fables, these traditions of man that make the, the, the word of God of no effect. Amen? We gotta know the truth, guys. That is not God causing all these bad things to happen in the earth. So we covered that, right? We covered God's original intent. We covered what do we, uh, why do we need Jesus? We covered the event, and then we covered the effect. Next week, we'll cover the solution, right? And then we'll answer the next two questions. Who is salvation available to you, and how do I get saved? Okay, we'll cover that next week. I'm excited about that. That is gonna be the fun part. And can I encourage you guys in this? You know, this is the most important message that I will ever teach hands down. This is the most important thing about Christianity is salvation, okay? It's about heaven, having etern spending eternity with God, not being cursed or damned to hell for eternity. This is by far the most important message I will ever teach. And can I encourage you in this not to reject salvation for anyone? Can I encourage you guys that please don't reject salvation for anyone and, in sh and share this message with everyone you know. Share this message with everyone you know. Go ahead and forward the message, amen? I believe that as I teach and as I cover some things, there's gonna be some things there that a lot of people have a false security of salvation. It's really important that they know the truth. You don't wanna have a false security that someone is saved thinking that they just said a, a prayer at the end of service and all of a sudden I'm saved and guys I studied this out a lot there is a, there is more to it than that okay and I'll cover that next week want to make sure that we have an absolute confidence that when I pass from this life into the next that I will spend eternity with God my salvation is secure and I am absolutely positive and I'm gonna show you how you can be absolutely positive. Amen? Okay, so love you guys. Um, look forward to seeing you next week. For those of you online, um, I, no I noticed that we have a lot of people watching right now. And if you guys want to reach out to me, maybe you have questions, maybe you have a comment that you would like to make, or you would just like to say hi, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at kawakamibh at gmail.com. Kawakami, K-A-W-A-K-A-M-I, B for Ben, H for Heidi, at yahoo.com. Kawakami, B-H at yahoo.com. Look forward to seeing you. Love you. Catch you later, okay?